Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for appearing here today, but also thank you for the many hours you've spent with the Commission and the staff in preparing this and, and your very fulsome prepared testimony as well as your, your remarks this morning. I, uh, I'd also like to express my personal high regard for you and for all the years of public service that you've given to this nation. Thank you. Um, we, of course, have, have, have a, a mission to fulfill, and one of the things that we obviously have to, to figure out is what happened on 9-11. But equally important to our mission is to figure out uh, the other factors that may have contributed to the situation we found at 9-11. And obviously, again, one of those is, is the development of our counterterrorism counter uh, strategy. And of course, we're, we're going to pick your brain and, and again today as far as the aspects of the military uh, fed into that. Um, and my colleagues have a lot of questions, so I'll try to watch that little ball as much as, as anybody. But um, under Presidential Directive 62, the military, of course, uh, and the Defense Department didn't have the leading role in counterterrorism efforts during your tenure. And yet, ironically, uh, we've heard a lot of testimony and a lot of commentary that the military was being criticized for being reluctant to use its, to use its forces and to conduct, actually conduct military operations against al-Qaeda and bin Laden. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, in Richard Clark's now very famous book, he, he says, uh, the White House wanted action. The senior military did not and made it almost impossible for the president to overcome their objections. Um, and, and I know that you've, you've seen other commentary like that, that the primary limitation that's often cited uh, uh, is, is that for each decision for using military force, there was this lack of actionable intelligence. And we've heard about it today, and we've heard about it a lot. And, and our understanding of that is what was stated earlier, that uh, at a specific time you couldn't anticipate where the, where the, uh, the location of bin Laden or his key followers might be so that uh, it could be sufficiently determined that it was uh, worthwhile to launch military reaction to it. Um, after August 20th of 98, there were at least three opportunities of which we've uh, been privy to use force against bin Laden. Uh, and however, in each case, it was determined that there wasn't actionable intelligence. Uh, I guess the first question I'd like to say is, whose call is that? I mean, how, how does that decision become a, a, a factor and a determinative factor? And, and in addition to that, if I could, uh, given that you had setbacks in using force, what was your assessment of the existing capabilities at that time of the CIA, the, which, capability? the existing capabilities, um, to obtain what would be required as actionable intelligence. And, and to the extent that uh, you found them deficient, uh, what steps did you take to supplement and, and to put into action things that the Defense Department could do to, to uh, beef up that, that capability? Uh, on the second part, uh, Mr. Fielding, uh, I think that Senator Kerry and others would uh, tell you that over the years, uh, one of the identifiable deficiencies within our intelligence um, uh, collection capability is the absence of good human uh, that we have uh, over the years tended to um, oscillate between focusing upon uh, technical uh, capabilities uh, with our uh, satellite um, gathering uh, technologies as opposed to developing uh, human intelligence. With the fall of the, uh, the collapse of the Soviet Union, of course, that becomes uh, a much more uh, challenging objective to get good human intelligence in areas that are governed by um, uh, tribal leaders uh, where an individual perhaps can uh, detect uh, who is a remote cousin uh, the minute they show up uh, within uh, 200 yards. Uh, so penetrating societies such as that become even more problematic in terms of developing good human intelligence. And then you're called upon to try and develop assets on the ground. Well, then the question is, uh, who uh, do you trust, and how can you trust them, and based on what evidence in the past that they have been credible? 
All of that goes into an analysis uh, by the, uh, the CIA, I, working with other intelligence agencies. Secretary Powell talked about uh, INR. We have DIA, the Defense Intelligence Agency. But essentially, we turn to the DCI uh, to say, do we have good intelligence? We review the PDB, has been discussed uh, earlier today. We uh, sit down uh, at the cabinet level meetings with the president uh, and or with the national security advisor and his team and say, is this good enough intelligence to warrant taking action? And each case has to be uh, looked at in that regard. Now, you mentioned uh, August of 98. Uh, frankly, it was following the bombing of the embassies in East Africa that uh, the antenna were really up. We were collecting uh, uh, at, a, at a level that I saw, it was unprecedented in terms of the amount of information coming in, pointing uh, to uh, bin Laden, and then getting the information there would be a gathering uh, of terrorists uh, in Afghanistan. After reviewing all that information, the determination was made this was a target, certainly, that we should attack. That plus uh, the so-called pharmaceutical plant in uh, Sudan. But it was that kind of a process whereby, what do we have? Uh, do we have to be certain? The answer is no. Do you have to be pretty sure? Uh, I think that the answer is yes, if you're going to be uh, killing a lot of people. Uh, we're prepared to engage in collateral damage if the target that we're after uh, is uh, uh, certainly important. Uh, but all those factors are into uh, a decision. But having, quote, actionable intelligence means reliable uh, and the basis of that reliability. Single source uh, information, usually I think uh, George Tenet will tell you not good enough. Uh, maybe if they've got a single source that is truly reliable, they've had them in the past, that might be under the circumstances. But it all depends upon the quality of the people you've got on the ground, coupled with whatever you can put up in the air to, uh, uh, to locate uh, certain targets. But who makes that final decision? Who makes President that United call? States, President of the United States makes the final decision. We make recommendations. Uh, we as the national security team would uh, sit down, uh, examine it, and then come to a consensus if we could. If we couldn't, frankly, uh, we would go to the president with our individual recommendations, but most of the time we were able to reach a consensus. And then the president weighs what has been recommended to him to act or not to act, and then makes the decision. Now, just following up again on my, on my earlier line of questioning, though, did you do anything or were there any steps available that you thought were worth taking to augment the CIA's capabilities for collecting intelligence? Uh, we worked with the, uh, the CIA. There were uh, some uh, uh, joint efforts as such to reinforce the CIA. We had a cooperative program in terms of the unmanned aerial vehicles, the UAVs. There was some controversy over that as well, I might add. Uh, but trying to um, find him uh, was certainly a, a joint enterprise uh, in terms of technical capability. Did we have uh, people on the ground in Afghanistan? The answer was uh, we did not for the, mo for the most part. Was that just not really a viable, realistic op option? Well, uh, again, uh, looking at Afghanistan, looking at the history of that country, look at the, the power and the... Um, uh, yes, the power and the, uh, the re relationship of the tribes in the region. The notion that we could put, quote, special forces in that region that would go undetected or uncompromised, I think uh, it was pretty remote. Uh, was it possible? Uh, you could say it was possible. Was it advisable? Uh, we didn't think so at the time, and I think uh, we, in reflection we still don't think that was a viable option. Okay. Uh, I'd like to ask your opinion because we have to evaluate the various, the three incidents, and we've heard a lot of testimony and a lot of writings that that particular second event that I made reference to, I think it was in February of 99, the hunting camp with the UAE right. hunting camp, that that was the lost opportunity. Well, you know, there were, as I recall, there were at least three instances in which the initial uh, intelligence take, as they called it, that we think we have him. And what we would then do is, quote, spin up uh, the, the military at that point, namely uh, our uh, ability to target that particular area with the thought of uh, taking that individual or group of people out. Uh, there were three instances. Each time the, uh, the uh, munitions and the people were spun up, uh, that uh, they were called off because the word came back, um, we're not sure. Uh, this is, uh, we're not quite sure. In one instance, uh, there was a an identifi identification that uh, somehow we had uh, bin Laden in our sights. Turned out it was a, a sheikh from uh, UAE. Another, uh, there was another uh, consideration of shooting down an aircraft. 
uh, that might be carrying a bin Laden should he try to escape. Uh, that also proved to be uh, reversed by the uh, intelligence community saying we're not, uh, we don't think we have him. So there were three occasions following the attack on the, uh, the camps in Sudan. Uh, but in each and every one of those occasions, it came back on a second look saying, we don't think uh, we've got enough here for, to recommend to the president that we should take military action. And that came from the intelligence community through uh, the national security advisor, and we all sat and uh, made a collective judgment, okay, under the circumstances, we don't uh, fire. Now, if you could assist us, uh, when we, if I can take you back to the, uh, the August 20th attack and response attack. Um, after that happened, there was criticism about the, the uh, pharmaceutical plant. Right. And there was also criticism uh, in general about trigger happy and this sort of thing. And recalling that negative reaction, uh, does that criticism affect the planning and use of military force in defending the United States in, in this context? I'm glad you asked that question, uh, Mr. Fielding, because it's something that uh, I've wanted to talk about for some time. In terms of the uh, kind of poisonous atmosphere that existed then, that continues to exist today, you're going to discuss uh, Mr. Clark's uh, book with him uh, tomorrow, but all of the accusations, uh, questioning motives, uh, and calculations. Uh, during that time, uh, when the attack was uh, uh, launched uh, in Afghanistan and Sudan, there was a movie out uh, called Wag the Dog. There were critics of the Clinton administration that attacked the president, uh, saying this was an effort on his part to divert attention from his personal uh, difficulties. Uh, I'd like to say for the record, under no circumstances did President Clinton ever call upon the military uh, and use that military in order to serve a political purpose. When I took uh, the office, uh, I had a very clear understanding with the president. He was very clear with me. Under no circumstances would I ever be called upon to exercise any kind of uh, partisan uh, relationship, would participate in no politics, and would never uh, allow the military to be used for a political purpose. President Clinton was true to his word. He never called upon us to do that. It was strictly on the merits. Now, that accusation surfaced again. And it was something of concern to me. I'll take just a few moments to express it. Uh, in um, that, that fall, I, mean, I should say that winter, in December of 1998, uh, we decided to attack Saddam Hussein. It was called Operation Desert Fox. It was a four-day operation in which uh, we launched a, a number of attacks upon his weapons of mass destruction sites, his missile production facilities, uh, and killing a number of Republican guards uh, and others. Uh, I got a call the day that that operation was launched. I received a call from Speaker Gingrich uh, and uh, soon to be, or then to be, Speaker Livingston, asking me to come up to Capitol Hill. They said the House was in an uproar. There was a rage boiling in the House of Representatives. This clearly had to be politically uh, inspired. Uh, I was eager to go up to the Hill. I had not been in the House of Representatives for 20 years. And I walked that evening uh, into the well of the House of Representatives. There were almost 400 people there. Uh, that night, maybe more, to a closed session of, ca of Congress. And I spoke for three hours, uh, assuring every single member that the reason we attacked Saddam Hussein was because of his non-compliance with the Security Council resolution, that at no time did the President of the United States ever seek to use that military strike in order to uh, avoid or divert attention from the impeachment process. Uh, I was prepared at that time and today to say uh, I put my entire public career uh, on the, the line to say that uh, the President always acted specifically upon the recommendation of those of us who held the positions of uh, responsibility to take military action, and at no time did he ever try to um, use it or manipulate it to serve his um, personal ends. And, I, and I, I think it's important that that be clear because that wag the dog uh, cynicism that was so virulent there, uh, I'm afraid it's, it's coming back again. And I think we got to do everything we can to stop engaging uh, in the kind of uh, self-flagellation and criticism and challenging of motives uh, of uh, our respective presidents. Thank you. I, I, the, uh, that also is the conclusion of the staff in the staff report but I'm glad you had a chance to, to elucidate on it. Um, on August 20th... Uh, last question. Okay, um, thank you. On August 20th, we, we heard about General Shelton uh, undertaking 
uh, a planning order for preparation of, of a uh, the follow-on operations, and obviously there were never any follow-on operations that came to fruition. Uh, but what direction did you give the military for development of, of military plans against bin Laden after August 20th for our guidance? Our plans were uh, to uh, try to, quote, capture and or kill, or kill, I should say, in this particular case, capture or kill uh, bin Laden. Uh, that was the directive uh, that went out, the memorandum of notification. The president had signed several of those, refining them on each and every occasion. Taking that uh, directive, we um, had our people in a position, should there be, quote, actionable intelligence, again, the key word, and we, can, we should discuss that and debate that issue of what constitutes it. But whenever there was, quote, actionable intelligence, we were prepared to take um, action to destroy bin Laden or, or the targets. Were there plans uh, to use uh, special forces to supplement uh, the Northern Alliance <coughs> if they were able to apprehend and uh, hold on to uh, bin Laden? The answer was yes. There were packages that were developed uh, uh, with our special forces um, uh, at Fort Bragg. There were a number of uh, proposals, quote, on the table or on the shelf prepared to, to be utilized in the event that we were certain and not certain to 100 percent degree, but reasonably certain that he was going to be at a given area. I know a question's been raised, well, why wouldn't you put a unit in there uh, with the anticipation that they could help gather intelligence and track him down? And I've tried to address this in my written statement, but consider the notion we have 13,500 troops in Afghanistan right now, not to mention the Pakistanis, and we can't find bin Laden to date. So the notion that you're going to put a small unit, however good, on the ground or a large unit, and put them into Afghanistan and track down bin Laden, uh, I, I think is, is folly. Uh, but if we had people on the ground, if we had the Northern Alliance, if they were reliable, did we have people prepared to go? The answer was yes. Um, General Shelton, I think, will tell you, it's very difficult to kill an individual with a missile. We all know that. You're talking about six hours from the time the quotes spun up. You've got the coordinates, GPS signals, target that individual. You're six hours away. To put troops on the ground, uh, was probably double that, that time. By the time you take a package and uh, fly them from uh, Fort Bragg or compose uh, some elements that were already in the Gulf, you're talking more than six hours. So the answer is, why don't you have forces on the ground uh, in Afghanistan? And the point I'm simply trying to make is that uh, the notion that you could put thousands or hundreds or even tens of people on the ground and hope to locate him under those circumstances, I think, is uh, simply unrealistic. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.